Hey, this is StarCraft 2 History, part 28, and this time I'm going to talk about Tasia's 2014 and just an overall video about Tasia as a player, Tasia, within the context of StarCraft 2 history. So we'll go over 2014 first. Typical Tasia in the fact that he doesn't do that well in uh, WCSNA, gets top 8 twice, doesn't get much further than that, and that's always been uh, one of the important knocks on Tasia as a player. Certainly a important knock that and his uh, G lack of GSL like um, victor victory basically in season one he loses to Hyun and in season two I think he loses to Pig Baby. Now that now with that out of the way, let's talk about what made him a great player throughout this year because this year is very similar to 2013 in that he could have been could have been and uh, was. Definitely voted by some people I respect in terms of their StarCraft 2 knowledge as the best player of the best Terran player of this year. And certainly the best or second the best player of uh, 2013 in in the same like sense. So what did he do? Basically in IEM World Championship he gets top four, loses to SOS, the eventual winner of the thing, but before that he beats Stardust and Life, and Life was and still in pretty good form at that time. Then you move on, home story cup, typical Tasia victory. Uh Harder than you would think, basically, because Jadong was still pretty decent. Uh, he beats Scarlet in the round of four, and Scarlet, if you don't recall, this is the time when I think she was at her best as a player. It was in tw the year of 2014. And then he beats MC in the finals. MC, still a decent Protoss, so not, not a bad result overall. What really makes uh, Tasia so like scary is basically the next two tournaments at IEMs. And... I am Senzen basically. He uh, let me see here beats MMA, then he beats Life, and then he goes to the round of eight, beats Zest. Zest was the best player. Beats Jadong, and then beats Solar, and that is a pretty fucking legit run, all things considered, because all those got none of those guys are uh, jokers, and a lot of people were try try to downplay what Tasia did at the time, but. As we know in the future, basically, Life in MMA, BlizzCon finalist, Zest, best player of that year. Jadong, still not a joke, still not a joke, but certainly he had an easier bracket just because he played Snoot in ZVZ. And what I mean by easier is that it's not like Zoot was bad. It's more like J that was Jadong's best matchup with ZVZ. And then he plays Solar, and Solar was a very good uh, Zerg player. I think probably the second best Zerg player at that time right after Sue. So... Like I said, no joke. Then you go to IEM Toronto, gets top four here, loses to Flash in the semifinals. But if, what's impressive here is actually he beats uh, Zest in the group stages again. So even though Zest had met and played against Teja, he still had no answer for Teja. And then you go towards his uh, BlizzCon, basically. And BlizzCon... Is where he basically kills the other the other best players of the year. So he beats Sue, then they beats Innovation, and then he loses to Life in the semifinals. And then you go to Home Story Cup, where he gets top four. And by this time he's already kind of out, but he loses to Flash here, and Flash himself loses to Parting in the finals. And then uh, at Dreamhack Winter, which is basically his like last serious run for the rest of his career, he gets second place in the group stages. Uh, and then he makes a de pretty decent run. Hero, San, Polt, Jokji, and then loses to Life in the, like, third place decider? I guess that's how you would put it, the third place decider. Now, given all that said, what what are the key matches throughout this year for Teja? I think the key ones are the fact that he plays Zest twice, he and then he plays Life um, multiple times, uh, beats Life early on before Life makes it, makes it come back towards the end of the year. And then he also beats Sue and Innovation, both of those players at BlizzCon, right after both of them had been in the GSL Finals. And that's sort of... I'll get back to that later when I actually talk about the BlizzCon 2015, because that's a pretty... Uh, 2014, because that's a pretty important sort of metaphor for all of this. But basically, I'll probably talk about it in the live video. But basically, when I think about Tasia, I think of this guy who didn't have the GSLs, he didn't have... The preparation tournament uh, victories but if you just look at his weekenders you realize something strange basically if you compare to all the other greats of all time 
all of them had like pretty similar amounts of chances in terms of getting these results, but only Teja has consistently been able to get that many victories. And that's against players comparing their entire careers where they have had like two or three times the amount of ears, even though like maybe in those ears there's less tournaments in them. In them. So when we think about Teja, basically, he goes from 2012 through 2014. That's arguably like some of the hardest periods you can play in as a Terran player. Because in 2012, there's Ruler and Fester. Then there's the Blink era. Then there's the Kesper transfers. Then there's... Um, all the all the shit going on, all the shit going around basically, and Teja for all this time has been consistently at the top, consistently one of the best Terrans in the world, and it's only at the end that people kind of realize, or maybe they don't realize it. Maybe it's just me who realizes it. Basically, the way he's been playing this entire time, it feels like he's playing the. It feels like you're watching. The ocean, it feels like you are looking into the expanse of the stars looks feels like uh, it feels like there's a depth to his play that has never truly that, ha, that can never be reached unless you are one of those all-time great players and what i mean by that is you look at that zest series uh, either of them you look at innovation versus tasia either in 2013 or 2014 you look at tasia versus sue all of those times basically sue lets our tasia versus rain all right a bunch of these choices basically what happens is Tasia lets all of them play their favorite styles into him and a lot of them were like macro players innovation rain zest sue all of them were macro players and all of them all fall down these were the best of the best among all the kespa i transfer overs and they played him Tasia, that is in their primes and Tasia slew all of them and that's kind of how you have to think about Tasia, because even though people like people have this weird sort of disconnect where they think of themselves as like, oh, those weekenders were weaker, but then you look at the paths, the players he played, some of them were like all time great players in the prime of their careers in some of those competitive eras. Like that's not that's never taken into account. Basically, when I did the initial list for Tasia and the greatest of all time, there's this weird thing that kept happening where when I counted the amount of players, like, yeah, there's things about prestige and things about preparation. These are important things. These are important factors. But Teja's, Teja's resume was so ridiculous at the time relative to everybody below him that even if you had, like, doubled, like, let's say, like, oh, to make up for preparation and prestige, you had to, like, double the amount of players beaten for, like, Teja did that. That's basically what Teja did. And then you look at his win rates against the all-time great players. At the time, somebody else had done it on Reddit. But basically, he had a winning percentage, a higher winning percent against every one of the other all-time great players, which was basically insane if you think about it. Because if you're just looking, if you think about it that way, it's like, yeah, he, w- he might have been the greatest player of all time just because of the way he played. And it's... Uh, he was just such a brilliant player, I guess. He was so consistently there. And he was also he's also very similar to life in the sense that if he played a lesser player, it was a complete trash game. Just throw away, don't watch that shit because it was so boring. But if you set him up against a truly great player, if you set him up against one of the all-time greats, life, rain, innovation, Sue, uh, Zest, right? Any of these guys was fucking fantastic. MVP actually had a pretty good series against him. So did Polt. So did MMA. Uh, MC definitely did. Like like I said, Teja had a bunch of these great series all throughout his career. And he was, uh, he was in my opinion, such a player that he, in a game of StarCraft, actually in every competition, it's like a series of never-ending decisions you have to make at any single moment and how you prioritize those those decisions. And I always go back to that Teja versus Innovation match in 2013 when Innovation was at the prime of his powers and the two of them were going back and forth on uh, Newkirk. And despite all the shit that was going down, because this was like a 15-minute game of non-stop action, of constant positioning, repositioning, re-evaluations of the, econom- of the economic state of the game, the comp- and... And where the opponent was attacking and where you can counterattack between Innovation and Tasia. 
But Teja, through all that chaos, and Innovation is doing the same, is like right up there with him. But Teja, through all that chaos, realizes, oh, Innovation fucked up the army comp because he didn't make any, he didn't rebuild any of his air army. I'm going to go a Banshee at the 60th minute mark or whatever it was and then go win the game. He does that, he wins the game. And that's just such incredible presence of mind because they're going at like 200, 300, uh, 400 APM at times throughout the entire thing. And there is so much to cover, but only Teja could have made that extra decision at that moment. And that's always been one of the funniest things to watch Teja because he wasn't a player that, as far as I know, he didn't practice in Korea very often. What I mean by that is he just didn't practice very often at all. So nobody in Korea knew how good he was because they didn't play on play him on ladder. And so what ended up happening was these guys met him in these foreign tournaments and they all, they all like, um, this is apparently what Meisen told me, they all like underrated the shit out of Teja and then they all got punished. Like they all, they, they all thought, oh, I'll just play my style against Teja. And that is a fucking mistake because Teja is actually better at their at their style of play, which is this macro style of play of making better decisions, basically being better at StarCraft, period. That That's what made Teja so, such a freak. Such a pro- prodigious character, such an incredible player. And it's also it's also why people had such hard such a hard time grasping Teja. Because it didn't feel like Teja was actually making some weird some incredible stylistic play. He was actually just out thinking his opponent every single time, consistently over and over and over again. And that's what amazes me even more is because that kind of style should break down in a stand in a standard weekender eventually, because Listen, weekenders, they're like messy marathon stamina events. Mo- majority of people cannot play that consistently for that long period of time, especially if you go to as many as Teja did. But he did it over and over and over again. And it's always amazed me. It still amazes me. I still think in that one single like achieve- achievement, basically, whichever way you want to put it, like incredible consistent peak from 2012 to 2014, or the way he played the game, or the amount of weekenders he won, because... That's not something anybody could ever match, basically. And that's that's his like claim to fame, so to speak. And he beat all these guys in their primes. And you just have to say, he was one of the all-time great players. In my opinion, the second most talented player to have ever touched the game after life. And it, I think I wrote about this a long time ago, but basically, Teja and life, to me, was the most important rivalry in StarCraft II history just because... Either of them could have been the greatest of all time, but because they both existed at the same time, they both got in each other's way a bunch of times. So I've always just thought that was sort of funny. And basically when Tasia falls, that's when life uh, really starts getting into fucking gear at the end of the year. And I'll get into that next time. But basically the fall of Tasia is the rise of life. And uh, that should be it for this this one basically, Tejo was an incredible player and generally underrated. See you guys later.